Hey, good evening. It's Wednesday. <laughs> are you ready? Are you ready? So I hope you are having a phenomenal day and enjoying the sunshine wherever you may be. I am Dr. Quinyon Nancy Scott, and I have the pleasure of sitting with Christina Cook. Washington Post Teacher of the Year. Yay, Washington Post Teacher of the Year. <laughs> and so we are looking forward to having a great conversation with you as we continue to talk about COVID-19 and how it's impact us overall in education. And today we're talking about engagement. Um, before we start talking about engagement and dive deep into that, over the week we've gotten lots of questions about things we talked about last week and how we can support um, continuing to support families. And so this is just FYI as a plug. We are going to, before the end of the week, to do a mock library session with parents just so that we can continue to support families even offline. Um, so please look toward one of our pages for more information as we continue to work with families so that we are providing support even while we're off the air. Mm -hmm. But question number one. Yes. So parent wants to know, um, as for a student schedule, should parents expect high school students to be self-sufficient? So ideally, we know that when students go to high school, they are typically on their own. Parents typically take away some of the um, focus that they've had and they put it on other things. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, do you think that parents should let up on their students? So the question, I mean, the answer to that question is no, um, because you know your child, you know what they stand in need of more than anyone else. Um, so at this point, like once kids are in high school, it's really about guidance and maintenance. So if you know your kid struggles with um, some executive functioning skills like organization, it would be great for you to know and have access to schedules. So if there's ever a discrepancy or you have a question, you have access and you can be proactive versus being reactive trying to figure it out. Yeah, and let me just say that can pretend as this was a normal school year as much as you can. And so if you would print the schedule out and put it on the refrigerator so that you would know, or in this particular case, print out the uh, schedule that they'll use for online, do that so that you can continue to have checks and balances. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Another question, um, how successful do you believe online teaching can be? I think it can be really successful because, I mean, let's be clear, online teaching isn't a new concept. Plenty of people have gotten degrees online for years. It's a new concept with um, the mainstream of education, but typically um, it's successful because it, it calls for a, a certain type of learner. So someone who chooses to go to school online probably is really busy. And I've learned busy people know how to get stuff done because they know how to manage their time. So. Um, I want us to focus, and Scott and I will talk about this today, not so much on the platform, but on the delivery of the person behind the platform. Because it's almost like asking, can you get saved virtually? You can have church virtually, and we've seen a televangelists do it for years. People come and give themselves over to Christ or whatever. So we're going to talk today about how um, engagement can affect um, how successful online learning is. Yeah, and I'll say that to your point, right, online learning is everywhere, and I think about the number of universities that have made, that's what they do, They're, they specialize in online learning. Um, I will say that it can be a transition, though. Mm -hmm. So I took my first online learning class this past semester mm -hmm. um, for certification purposes, and I took two classes in the fall. Well, one class I got an A, mm -hmm. and one class I failed. <laughs> And so, you know, means fantastic. <laughs> I wished, right? And so what I had to do was I had to take the class over again because yeah. I had to be recertified. Mm -hmm. But the idea was that I had to change how I was interacting with the class mm -hmm. because this particular teacher demanded that I check in on the class every single day. Mm -hmm. And so part of it was creating a special schedule just for the class in order for me to meet the demands. So parents, it's going to be extremely important for you to continue that check-in process mm -hmm. because the first couple of weeks just with anything yeah. can be a little difficult as we're starting in yeah 
All right, another question. Will teachers be able to teach everything online? So thinking about some of the electives, gym, is there anything that you can think of that a teacher couldn't teach online? No, I can't uh, because there's a way to do it. it. It just doesn't look like the traditional way. So if I was a PE teacher, you know, kids would come to my gym class. Well, what I would have students do is, hey, if they're able to go outside in their yard or in their deck, I would even have them put on their gym clothes. And so I would, they can frame their phone so I could see them, whether I'm asking them to jump rope, whether I'm asking them to do jumping jacks, and I can check off if, they're have, if they have mastery with those skills. So I can't think of any subject that you can't do from home. I even saw a teacher recently uh, do a whole science experiment on the stages of the moon. And so some of the pre-work involved students having a piece of bread that their parents didn't mind them wasting, um, but she literally had them prep that beforehand. It's going to take a lot of planning, but it most definitely can be done. All right, awesome. And so um, the last question I had is that what if you don't have all the proper technology you need in order for your child to be successful? Yeah, so the great question. The schools have it. Um, so whatever you stand in need of as it relates to technology, please, whoever you are, reach out to the school district because that's really their responsibility at this point to provide families with the access to access the technology. So if you find it as a challenge, please reach out to Dr. Scott or myself and we can assist you with having that conversation with getting Chromebooks, MacBooks, um, re reduced internet or free internet services, cell phones, all of that is now available um, in school districts. Yeah, and many of our, the larger school districts, um, I'm thinking it's about specifically in the DMV area, they are actually um, providing those services for students and so they actually have um, long lines. So if you mm -hmm. need a Chromebook or if you need a iPad, um, kindergarten through 12th grade are providing this for you. If you're at a smaller school, they're also doing many of the same things. Yeah. So many of the schools March through June received additional funding mm -hmm. and that additional funding is to support in situations like this. So please um, don't be embarrassed or don't be shy, but letting families know, letting the school know what your family may be in need of. Absolutely. All right, now it's time for engagement. <laughs> okay, we got a little dance to do, okay. And so um, part of the success is being fully engaged and what's going on. And so we're just gonna kick off about engagement and, and how do we move forward to make sure that our children are prepared. Yeah, so I would say that engagement is like the newest and most popular buzzword mm -hmm. because we used to be high touch which means you could feel my energy. You can walk into my clean, bleach-smelling classroom. Isn't that right, Dr. Scott? Bleaching bleach fabulosa, sure. right? And, and I could greet you with a hug, a handshake, a high five, something, some type of words of affirmation. You could feel that energy, and you would feel invested. Well, guess what? I'm going to still be able to give you that type of um, feeling, but I'm going to do it through the screen. So what does that mean? I have to be creative on how I want you to participate. And that's really what engagement means. It's meaningful involvement. So you notice that Dr. Scott and I week by week have been involving our audience in engaging ways. We've asked for people poll questions. We've asked you to email us. Uh, we even shot people out on the call who are doing incredible things. This is a way to make you feel, yes, you, you. <laughs> We want you to be a part of this conversation with us. So by definition, engagement is simply meaningful involvement, okay? And there's different kind of engagement. Yes. Right, and so when I think about the person who, the child who doesn't have the cognitive ability mm -hmm. to be engaged, um, what are some strategies that we can provide for folks about how do you support cognitive yeah. engagement? So number one, the first strategy is knowing where the cognitive deficit is, right? Because you can't support something that you can't name. Um, and with a, a platform like Zoom, you'll be able to break kids off into what they call breakout rooms and host and blast messages and give directions. And you can use Google Classroom uh, create small videos for kids to watch while they're in breakout rooms to be engaged. 
Um, so that's one way to do it uh, for a kid who has a cognitive development. Um, the other two are behavioral and emotional. So you, you, you figure um, kids you are used to coming to a classroom, lining up outside the door, walking in, taking their seat. Well, they're taking their seat now at their dinner table or their kitchen table and looking at you in Zoom. So one way you can involve kids if emotionally is have music playing when they enter your Zoom classroom, right? It can be, you know, your favorite song or take a poll, it's their favorite song and have them type their name in the chat as they enter and maybe type their favorite quote. Um, that's a way to engage them emotionally. I'm asking them one simple question. How are you doing? is a way to engage them behaviorally for my gym teachers and my elective teachers. Get kids up and moving away from their seat um, during uh, remote learning, right? Have kids stand up, clap their hands, say, I'm gonna throw you the wall, hey, whatever you need to do to get them moving and they can feel that energy. Yeah, I agree. I do wanna get back to the behavioral piece. Mm -hmm. um, and so you talked about those special engagements for those students, but we know that right now administrators are concerned because when they think of behavior, mm -hmm. they're thinking of the student who is really disengaged mm -hmm. and they are creating other things yeah. on the Zoom call. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have administrators asking the question like, how do you suspend virtually? Right. Um, what do you Craziness. do to stop uh, the student from disrupting the class virtually? Mm -hmm. um, and so, but it really starts with behaviorally, yeah. you know, what that engagement looks yeah. like. Um, I want to provide some additional suggestions mm -hmm. like um, do kinesthetic activities. Mm -hmm. So make sure that although you're online, when they're in breakout rooms, they're constantly doing things and they constantly have some interaction in the computer, that's going to stop some of the behaviors Absolutely. from continuing to grow. Um, the other thing is that when they show up, making sure they have to show up with something, mm -hmm. right? So if you assign homework, making sure that the homework that you assign, that is a pass for them to be successful inside of the class. So making mm -hmm. sure you publicly check yes or no, you did it or you didn't do it. Um, so there's other different strategies that can be provided so that even when the student is disengaged, mm -hmm. they get effort and support for just showing up. Yeah. Um, emotionally mm. so we've talked a lot about creating this special room um do you have any advice on how do you bring emotional engagement for both teacher and for student yeah so it's twofold right there has to be number one a relationship okay kids can't learn from people that they don't like and that's from the late great my soror from the ted talk you showed it to me um dr pearson um, she did this amazing TED talk on how who kids learn from them, even as adults. You don't learn from people that you don't like. So as we talk about this emotional engagement, we need to constantly talk about building relationships. So to, to Dr. Scott's point and to her question, the uh, ratio between negative and positive interactions needs to be higher for that positive deposit into that account, right? Building engagement is about making positive deposits enough so when you have to withdraw you don't have you don't end up in the red now y'all don't y'all know what i mean when your account is in the negative <laughs> you know what i'm thinking about the book that we went over how full is your bucket you yes i do so one of our lifelong learning books i don't remember if it was this year or last year do you remember um it was last year's book okay yeah. so we so each year our leadership team brings about four to five books and one of my all-time favorite yes. books is how full is your bucket mm -hmm. and it really talks about a lot of emotional intelligence emotional mm -hmm. engagement and so it presents itself that everyone has a bucket and yep. so we're all buckets and if you can imagine we're all a bucket of water and mm -hmm. based upon our interactions with someone determines whether or not you deplete my bucket yes. or you fill, fill my, my bucket, bucket. Mm -hmm. and so part of it is is that teaching students how to be resilient mm -hmm. when the teacher may deplete their bucket yeah. without even knowing it. Absolutely. The other part is teaching teachers how to continuously fill, fill the buckets. bucket um, even when other things are happening that you can't control, um, such as COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And so part of it, how full is your bucket? I don't remember the author, but it was Tom something yeah. <laughs> um, but it's a great depiction about utilizing yourself 
and identify emotionally what you need because when you can determine what you need you can then determine how people fold or deplete your own oh, absolutely i agree with that and i think it's intentional right we know when we're not our best selves and i think as educators we need to be transparent about those moments because we have the power with our tongue every single day to speak life into someone's child's life or to speak death into that child's life. And so I think it's important that we are transparent and we are intentional about our planning, how we want to engage children so we don't have a lot of moments of depleting buckets unintentionally. Yeah, you know, one of the things that um, we haven't talked about is that, you know, we talked about the teacher mm -hmm. and the student in reference to the emotional engagement, but the truth of the matter yeah. is, parents often deplete the child's bucket yeah. before the child even shows up. Yeah. And so part of that is knowing your child and understanding what depletes their bucket. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the book, there was a scenario. And the scenario was, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I had breakfast, um, I, I was running late, we were always running late, yep. and I was telling my child, come on, come on, you gotta get ready, you gotta get ready. And while I was sharing that, he spills the cereal. Mm -hmm. And so, he spills the cereal, we're about to be ready to get ready for work, and we should be walking out the door. Mm -hmm. What is the emotion that I now display? Yeah, like you, you are displaying impatience, you're displaying disgust, irritation for your kid before they even make it to the school. House. But now I'm outraged yeah. because you have milk all over the floor and we're gonna be with late. cereal <laughs> and I gotta get you another bowl of cereal. Yeah. All because you didn't pay attention and I've told you a hundred times to pay attention. Yeah. And so this simple accident Mm -hmm. right now turns into a snowball yeah. of emotional depletion mm -hmm. because I am upset yes. and even if I try to rectify the situation once I get home I've still depleted for the entire day mm -hmm. and so if we could rewind right looking at that same scenario part of it is it's okay to make a mistake. Absolutely. I give you permission to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Accidents happen. happen. Yeah. And so understanding that these things are okay, and then that it changes the emotional engagement mm -hmm. that your child will then have with somebody else. Correct. And so be, making sure that you're aware of what's that engagement that you have with your families mm -hmm. as they begin the school day. Yeah, and I think it also teaches them how to respond and react to others when they make a mistake, right? So a lot of times, you know, we'll say, oh, you you just like your mother, you just like your father. And, and that's a positive and a negative thing. But they have learned a lot of their behaviors from how they've seen us interact. So it's just really important that we're all transparent and cognizant of how we're showing up every day as families and as teachers and as schools. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, talk about, so there's, a, the, in many cases, somebody asked about the schedule. Mm -hmm. um, students may be online all day. Right, and so when students are online all day, they're gonna need pick-me-ups. Mm -hmm. um, in many cases, that can be fresh fruit, granola, um, having a small snack or a small drink. And so as I'm thinking about the behavioral engagement, I'm thinking about things that causes us to change who we are. Yeah. So because we change who we are, we're less engaged. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. I'm hungry. Yeah. And so what's my engagement level if I'm hungry? Um, none for me. If I'm hungry, it's a, it's a wrap. Like, <laughs> and then that's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Before I can teach you, I need to feed you. So it's important that parents throughout the day, you set up a schedule for your kids, just like if they were in school where they can get a snack. And most teachers are lenient about kids having a snack while they're on a Zoom. And you know, again, that's something that you can have a conversation with your child's teacher about this upcoming school year. You know, what's your snack policy? How does that work? Yeah, I completely mm -hmm. agree. Um, what do you think about having students they're on Zoom, they're supposed to be visible. Uh, what do you think about them choosing not to be visible on the call? Yeah, so that's a, that's a tricky question. It's hot. That's why we got on these red lips and red glasses today, yes, right? Yes, honey! <laughs> that's a hot topic and hot question because now you're starting to dive into privacy. 
And so because kids are in their parents' homes, there are some families that don't want their home to be shown on camera. And there's some school districts that have to respect if a particular parent uh, doesn't want that as an option. Um, again, we're going back to engagement. It is really, really hard to engage with just a blank screen um, because you can't see the other person's expression and you don't know how they're responding to what you're doing. So I think that's a really tough question that you as a family and you in that particular school district have to have. Um, I would hope that all of my students would want to have their cameras on and that their families would be okay with it. But in the event that they are not, I have to respect that family as my partner you know, for not wanting that to be the case. Yeah, I completely agree yeah. with you. Um, I was actually thinking about the number of children, and so I'm thinking about entry grades. Mm -hmm. So kindergarten, first grade, sixth grade, some cases fifth, and ninth grade, which are entry points mm -hmm. where the student may not know the teacher right. or the school may not know families. And so what are different strategies yeah. that the school can do to make the student feel warm and welcome yeah. so when they have to show up, mm -hmm. they're okay and they're comfortable with being in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to be inviting because the teacher the first day has to put on everything. Yeah. So engagement really just isn't about the student. Right. Part of it is about the teacher and how engaging and exciting are you mm -hmm. for me to continuously to show up yeah. and so what what support would mm -hmm. you give teachers for a teacher saying nobody should have shown up yeah I would start calling now school starts in less than four weeks in some districts um, some schools going into you know the second week in I mean first week of September start calling families now Mm -hmm. um, if you have access to a, a directory and you know what grade level you're going to be teaching, call families now and extend the olive branch. Hi, I'm Christina. I'm your kid's English teacher. I wanted to reach out to you before school starts because we're in unprecedented times. And I want to make sure that you're comfortable, that I'm comfortable, that little Susie Q is comfortable. So again, when you have to withdraw from that bank, you have built that relationship with that family. They can trust you because people People do business with people they know, they like, and they trust. And that even means in a school system. That's one of the ways you can do that. And if you feel, hey, I don't have access to those numbers, everyone's on social media. If you have an Instagram page and you know you're connected to kids, start doing your welcome back videos. Mace, uh, the rapper from the 99 and the 2000s, has an incredible song called Welcome Back. Start making TikTok videos. Start doing all the things to welcome children to make that transition as smooth as possible so when they land in your space, that's one less issue you have to worry about. Teaching instruction, closing achievement gaps is hard enough. Can you imagine doing that with kids who hate you? So it's never going to happen. Right? <laughs> and so Dr. Pearson said it best. Yeah. If a student doesn't like you, a student's not going to show up. It's not going to be engaging. Yeah. I'm thinking about the school in Atlanta. When we went to a conference in Boston a few years ago, we their speaker was... Um, the guest speaker was their school principal and he talked about the first day of school. Mm -hmm. They roll out the red carpet, carpet um, in the red carpet. They send them care packages mm -hmm. for the first day. And so we know that a lot of organizations boxes have become so popular. So they have welcome boxes. Mm -hmm. I was very proud of my alma mater. They uh, students came back today and students got welcome boxes yeah. when they arrived. And so to your point, Cook, you know, you want to make students feel and families feel like they can trust you yeah. and so whatever you're telling their students is working and they can make sure that everything is okay mm -hmm. uh, any more questions um, no we didn't have any more are there any questions from the audience we see folks have chimed in and hey we see y'all hey guys hey. does anyone watching live have any questions on the spot so, I was actually thinking about this earlier today, and it really resonates with me. So we talked about school pods, and one of the mm -hmm. questions, what school pods really quick is when you have a group of families that get together, those group of families that get together, and they make sure that they are supporting each other once a week, uh, twice a week, so that the heavy lift is not just on one parent. And so one of the parents chimed in and said, how do we get this going ourselves? Mm -hmm. um, instead of waiting for the school system to create pods 
for us, which is never going to happen, right. right? And so how do we get this going? Um, is there any advice that you would have for mm -hmm. a family who says, look, I don't really know anybody, yeah. or I'm not sure who else is in this situation, but I do want to be in a situation where if I can call on someone for help, this is who I, what I do. Yeah, so I would say your first line of defense is like a PTA, um, because typically, you know, you have a lot of active parents there who are probably thinking the same way you're thinking about school and, you know, how learning is going to look. So I would start with my local PTA and see what families have already created or be interested in creating that type of environment with you. And you know what? You guys don't have to wait until school starts. Scott and I talked last week about the skills that kids need. Start with the book club. Right. You don't even need the school to help you um, initiate that process. Like find a book that kids want to read and kids are talking about. I can give you a, um, a few uh, if you have any middle school kids. Black Brother, Black Brother is a good one. Look Both Ways by Jason Reynolds is another one. Tight is another one. Anything Walter Dean Myers is another one for my high school students. Come on, get yourself a little piece of Invisible Man while you can. Uh, but start a club where kids are just engaging with each other and then that'll build and form into something else. You might find out that your kids are in the same classes um, and then they can, again, start to do the work together. Yeah, and for our elementary school folks, you know, the idea of having a class roster is still moving around mm -hmm. in many school districts. And so where you have a roster, everyone shares their information. Yeah. And then you have to be the one that initiates, mm -hmm. hi, let's start a school pod. Do yeah. you have any availability? There may be already some families that already have all the information mm -hmm. for successful um, remote learning based upon what they did from March to June. I know I was on a call on Saturday. Sunday, um, Shayla Adams, yeah. who is um, running for office in Prince George's County for the school board. So shout out to Shayla. Mm -hmm. um, and I was excited to be on her congratulations call. Yeah. Uh, but she did a lot of work for us she at did. C on, um, for project-based project -based learning. learning. Yeah. And so uh, <clears throat> part of the, the beauty of, I'm mentioning Shayla's information, is that it's just a connection. Like I mm -hmm. met her through a connection with some Somebody else. Yeah. And so I just reached out to somebody and said, hey, I need some support with project-based learning. And they said, well, let me connect you to Shayla. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is utilizing your connections and having people to utilize their connections yeah. in order to solve the problem. But if you don't let folks know that you have a need, yeah. or if you have a desire to do anything, then you don't know anything. Absolutely. Um, so making sure that whatever your need is from a parental standpoint, um, you're very very vocal about that and so over the last six weeks we've covered a lot of things mm -hmm. um, just some highlights for you to think about making sure that you provide your children with school supplies um, mm -hmm. we both have um, <laughs> ideally put a school supply list online and so please make sure that you follow that please make sure that your school supply list also includes what your children will look like. Yeah. That's so important for building their engagement of uh, behavioral engagement. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that is extremely important is making sure that uh, in advance that you've tested out everything. So yeah. if you're purchasing technology, if you're getting technology from the district, making sure that you're utilizing that district not technology in advance. Yeah. So it's not the first day of school and you're like, I can't believe it, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Remember the first day determines what the last day is gonna look like. Yeah. We have a question from the audience. Okay, we have a question from James. How do children with disabilities, autism, et cetera, return to school or children who need that personal one-on-one -on -one interaction? Yeah, so James, thank you for that question. So like, that's the, that's the real deal. And again, this is the piece where the school, and the, when I say the school, I mean the special education coordinator, that special education teacher, that general education teacher, and your student, you all need to sit and have a conversation about what that looks like. Because under the law, your kid is owed those hours and those services. And I want you to know this, James, from the bottom of my heart, it is on the top priority list for schools because it's pressing and it's necessary. So please speak to your school district, specifically the special education coordinator about what is the plan to support. And I know some schools are even willing to meet with families outside of the virtual learning to make sure that that connection happens. So have that conversation and see. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I would say um, in addition to that, 
you as a parent need to understand uh, the IEP, the yeah. Individualized Educational Plan. Making sure that you understand that every plan includes two goals. Mm -hmm. Those goals include one English goal and one mathematical. goal. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you know what those two goals are and that you also know what is the plan for how to make sure that your child has a successful year. Mm -hmm. Typically meetings are annually, right? So once a year you come into the school. If you have not gone into to the school since COVID, you want to connect to who's ever responsible for that IEP mm -hmm. plan, and you want to go over that plan with them on the phone. Yeah. You know, are the goals still the same? What are some benchmarks mm -hmm. that we can identify together to make sure that the child is matriculating the way they're supposed to be, even through COVID period of time? Yeah. So typically, goals span a whole entire year. You want to make sure that you benchmark those goal that one year goal and identify what you should do. Yeah, absolutely. That was great, James. Thank you. For yeah, that. thank you, James. Mm -hmm. But you know, one of the things that's huge is um, how children feel. Yeah. And if they don't feel like they are moving forward, then mm -hmm. they won't. Correct. And so um, our students with disabilities, they will experience a lot of regression. Mm -hmm. uh, and so part of it is making sure that you're doing small drills with them just to make sure that they're able to remain focused. Mm -hmm. But part of the biggest thing is identifying what those goals are. Yeah and then chunking those goals to ensure that you're able to meet the goal overall in that year span time. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. As always, it's been a wonderful Wednesday. We are moving toward uh, the next one having workshop style so that we can mm -hmm. provide you with showing you engagement opportunities yeah. moving forward. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.